have to ask yourself how much of John Lennon's spectacular work was a concomitant mixture of acid, meditation, money, fame, power, ego, yoko, guilt, insanity, grief, whimsy, etc. And how much was the uncluttered imprint of his obviously prominent muse? How many artists have been able to move through so many distinct phases in their work? If you look back to Love Me Do, it's a very long way forward to Mr. Kite, and even longer to the bare-boned simplicity of songs like Imagined and Love. With Double Fantasy and the posthumously released Milk and Honey, he seemed to start the machine all over again. One of the great things about Lennon's eclectic persona was the delightful tangle of the many component parts that made up his frankly rather fragmented though always engrossing super personality. When you go down the list of the great artists of the last hundred years, Picasso was always Picasso, with his boxy images of womankind with their bright burning eyes. Dolly, too, was certainly always Dolly, Magritte always Magritte, Dylan always Dylan, Sinatra always Sinatra, Hendrix always Hendrix, but Lennon, curiously, was at least half a dozen completely autonomous, highly stylized artists. He even looked quite different year to year. Like the lizard on a window pane from Happiness is a Warm Gun, John was certainly a man of many colors, though at the end the unhappy truth is that they all bled together, turning a confused, muddy brown. A story still yet to be told. Upon reflection, it may be that the bigger part of everyone's existence is that which they leave behind. For most of us, that probably means a couple of kids, some vague memories, and one or two outstanding debts. But for a man like Lennon, the list is obviously a little longer. In fact, conceptual though it is, there are still so many significantly affected by his challenging words and music that I have titled this collection Imagination in honor of this borderless collective of kindred spirits. They might also be called Leninites, I suppose. Anyway, as John once said, I hope someday you'll join us. Lennon drew on a vast field of sensory and intellectual experience when composing. Here he responds to a reporter's questions concerning the effect of mantra and thus repetition on his work. What you write is influenced only by everything, not by specifics. Maybe something will influence you more. If the chair leg broke, you know, you might drop that into the into your song you're writing on that bit of paper now. But I don't specifically think uh, uh, in and I learnt meditation, therefore I'll put mantra into the song as a basic format for you know. It just happens, uh, but everything that happens to me. Uh, it, rubs off on me, you know, and I'm influenced by everything and everyone. So it's no deeper than that, you know. In this charming interlude, John remarks on the rather extraordinary ending of Hey Jude. Well, the ending was so good, we kept, we kept on going, you know, when we got into it, we couldn't stop it. On a lot of them, you know, we get into an ending, but we never got seven minutes. That ending was so good, it was, you know, on its own. We really hammered it home on that, you know. One of the terms coined by John back in the late 60s was philosorock, the meaning of which is, I believe, fairly obvious. Let's see what John had to say about it, however. Philosorock is like um, uh, all that, the psychedelia that all the pop groups went through, you know, and, the, and we went through it too. And that, I, it's valid, because it was an experience we all went through, but now it's saying get back, you know, instead of... Hello? Uh, you know, get back, uh, monkey, to throw calling? something in. Oh, this is... Uh... Most of the lyrics on the new album are just sort of straight, you know, I love you and you love me, and we're all together, you know, without the, the other bit. But that's it, you know, it depends how you feel. There's still one of them on it, I just have fun with the words, you know, and they'll all be digging about to see what it is. And it's exactly what, whatever you like, you know, because I just enjoy playing with words. But more, mainly it's just like the new single, Get Back and Don't Let Me Down, I Love You, Don't Let Me Down, I Love You, you know. It's not a con, it's just, you know, fed up of that suit. And, and everybody's going through it, Dylan, you know, and nobody's sitting down and planning the next move for where we're all going to go. 
because everybody had enough of it, you know. It seems like, and everybody wants to kick out the jams, as they say. I believe the saying over there. Here, Mrs. Lennon speaks out on the profound benefit she achieved from linking up with John. Well, my side of the benefit is pretty obvious, I suppose. You know, first of all, the obvious side is that, you know, this, he has created a whole era of this swingingness, etc. You know, before that, there was nothing happening in London, you know. And he has a fantastic sense of humor. And my work tended to be very serious. Now, of course, I had my sort of sense of humor in, in some ways. But um, it, it's a kind of cynicism, maybe. You know, let's, let's say cynicism that I had in my work. And uh, then it was becoming a bit too serious for me to take, you know. And I was just sort of fed up with it. And, and the fact that... Uh, he was not only intelligent, but he had something plus intelligence, which is uh, a way of thinking in life, you know, which made him different from the other intelligent people. And uh, it's very interesting, you know, that sort of changing the world with sense of humor, you know, that kind of thing. And that liberated my, my thinking. Public reaction is something that I can't control and I can't uh, uh, preconceive, you know. And so I don't, I don't decide my action on the preconception of as to how the public would react to it. You see, so I just can't do that, and I never did. You know, it's something else. And of course, because I'm interested in communication. Because I feel that art is communication, uh, communication is art, you know, it's that bit. Uh, I am, uh, you know, very interested in public reaction, I suppose, you know, of my work and etc., of our work at this point. I don't think that side, uh, I mean, our work, you know, is communicating independently. I mean, you know, that side has been uh, destroyed at all. I mean, you know, communication is still going through, you know. I mean, they're laughing at us, etc. You know, criticizing us, etc. But despite that, you know, that's going through. Our message is going through, so it's all right. You know. Here, a reporter wonders: Was Lenin as anti-war, anti-establishment, and pro-peace when he was first a Beatle? He couldn't say I was a violent guy. You know, uh, so I was anti-war then. But now um, the slogan is peace. You know, still anti-war. When we talked about uh, what we think about war and all that, yes, thank you. we came to the conclusion that peace is the alternative, you know, I mean, it, it's like knowing it already, but doing something about it. I mean, Yoko was doing it anyway, peace demonstrations in a way, but she wasn't allowed to do too much demonstration in England because she was an alien. And now she, so well, now she I can subvert. just about do everything. But now she's married to me, we can, well, we can do things like that, real you know, and we think that's a positive, real way of doing it, you know. And uh, we, believe, we went through a lot of months of thought of the best way for John Lennon and Yoko Ono to do something about peace and the most effective and broad way of doing it was for us to dedicate our honeymoon to peace and blab off about it for 10 days to the press. And the press is like a letterbox. You post letters and some of them get through and some get dirty and some get lost. But it gets through if you send off 2,000 letters with the same message on. If I had a newspaper, I'd love it. Mm. Yeah, I think the press is. I just think TV is a bit more important now at mm. all. But I've not anything against the press. You know, they're human beings. You know, and I've nothing against the police. They're human beings. But I get uptight about the same things anybody else does. You know. I saw uh, some very famous uh, people got married recently, and they got uh, uh, like 50 minutes of TV coverage. You know and uh, something like that and they were making a statement just to the effect that they're going to get married and they're happy about it or something like that and uh, i thought well while they're just saying well yes i'm going to get married you know something daft does that you know why couldn't they just plug peace like, like saying you know uh that's 15 minutes precious time of tv you know you know and the world is in this chaos and everything and uh, instead of 
you know, announcing something personal as that, they could use that and say, well, uh, and by the way, let's have peace, you know, by the way, why don't we stop violence? Why can't she say that, you know? So that's what ex we did, exactly. In other words, we're going to get the press on anyway. Also, so Everybody's why do we waste it, it, it on Nobody's us, you know? Saying it, you know. No, you know, the queens and the prime ministers and all the people in the public eye. Why don't they talk about it all the time? You know? Instead of saying, Instead well, of saying we're gonna we might have a meeting it, about it. a meeting about having a meeting to talk about. <laughs> you know, why don't they just talk about it on that instance that right, they're direct, talking? Direct, you know, yeah. Even if they tell the public what they're trying to do about the meeting, that the meeting is going to be the meeting. Because <laughs> you know? actually it's like a dirty word, you know. And I'm like, okay, that the psychedelic period, etc. Everybody's saying make love not war, but now, especially in America, they're saying kill the pigs. You know, and that the establishment know how to play violence. You know, that they've been playing it for millions of years. And they're never going to win. But pigs happen to be other human beings. And if they think bringing back hanging to kill murderers is the answer, that's what they're saying, mm -hmm. kill the pigs. Bring they ought to bring back hanging and, and whipping them the stocks, you know. You can't have one without the other, really. But it's the same bit, you know. They're not going to make it, you know, like that. And so if they do make it violently, they take over the states or anywhere, they're going to have to smash it all down first, and then they're going to spend the next generation or so building it all up again. And if, they, if it's like Russia, and they build it up into another one, you know. And it's never... They always say, give peace a chance, and give non-violence a chance, because nobody ever has. You know, there's just nobody has ever tried it, you know, and they've tried all the revolutions. I think, I really think also that uh, uh, when I say intelligence plus something, you know, I mean, that's oh. where John is different from others, and in that sense, Hello? I really think that John is really the Hello? greatest mind, you know, that I've met in a way. Hello. And, uh, is it, uh, is Peter there? The point yeah? is that he's playing Oh, the guy with down. the contract bit. Playing down. Oh, yeah, well, he's left, you know, he's, oh, he's, just, he's here now. His intelligence. Yeah. Listen, uh, Instead yeah. of playing yeah. his intelligence okay, hang fully, on a bit. Oh, wait till he he's playing the clown, you, you know. Yeah, I'm just looking for a coat, but I didn't have one instead. Yes. What's the number? Now or he did? Playing the clown. Well, okay, I mean, you know, he's doing that now more so, I suppose, you know. Well, in other words, we're doing it now. All right? But oh, I've well, never met a man a anyway. who was doing and, and that. And it's okay. You'll words, see it when you get there. And he can like, I was trying to do yes. that, you know. Yeah, I had that. Well, I, I really did I had it, a feeling know, always no that all that, uh, the okay, male race in the then. world is yeah. a little bit limited, you know. Because um, the main thing is... They tend to be too serious. They tend to, you know, be too professional. Professional meaning limited, you know, one field, etc. You know. Uh, it was just having too much guy. professional he's, he's a, pride a guy, and, it was and a, being a blocked of, by that, uh, you know, a having a mind block like, like that, so it, you know, the guy not that we got having a versatile free so mind oh, because of that. Uh, you know, like in a small office, and only becoming just getting going, but he was hip or like. as soon as they so get hold of it or something. You know, I mean, the general type of men I consider is the clerk type, you know, who has one power and trying to hold on to that. And that goes with all the artists as well, you know, a painter holding on to one tiny idea and saying that he's a painter and building up his painting career on that one tiny idea, uh, and I've it. never so done that myself, so I always thought that I was superior to male race. It, <laughs> you know, male race, the... that is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, and then I met this phenomenon. Oh, he's fine, you know, but I, I think that... He to be uh, pretty versatile himself, smart, you know, Alan I mean, superbly uh, so. Harold. Yeah, yeah, but and, uh, he, he is independent, you know, that's isn't all right. He's the type it's of male that I expected sure a male to be, you know. Look, we're we're giving some laugh to the world, you know, as Lauren Hardy did, you know. The fact is, back in 1969, John Lennon was even considered outrageous to the art world and quite regularly upset even the anything goes avant garde. The Beatles' whole career was spent with trying to turn me down on stage. <laughs> you know. We're, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're not trying to create uh, people into small dolls, you know, sort of nice, well behaved, you know, little dollies, you know. I mean, all right, so everybody has this natural aggression on it. It's beautiful, you know. But let it out in a different way. Why sh should you kill people, you know? I mean, that's sort of like a... I mean, I'm, I'm an aggressive guy, I always have been, and I used to... It used to be manifest in fighting at school and mm -hmm. things like that. But there comes a time where they either get beaten up, which I had 
what had happened to me, or you meet your match, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then it hurts, you know, and uh, <laughs> you then you've got to work it out, you know, and why, then I don't want to be always attacked by some guy on the street, you know. So if we could just have it so as the aggression, you know, there was a good play on TV once about, <laughs> there's quite a few, I'm a TV fan, though. but, uh, and they had it worked out that all the killers of the world had some kind of club, you know, and they could kill each other with freedom, well, let, let, that's all right, I don't mind. If you want to kill him and he agrees that you're going to fight to the death, you know, as long as you don't do it in front of me because it would upset me or involve me. But if you want to, you know, we have got the machinery and the intelligence to channel it and have, you know, aggressive places to go and play in, you know, go, let's give them the desert and they can all take all the tanks there and anybody who wants to play killing can play as long as they don't bug me with it or people I love, you know. So when people say, well, well all aggressive man is a natural yeah. aggressive animal, we're saying, okay, so what, you know? So it still doesn't have to, sort of, we don't all have to be involved in other people's games. Yeah. You know, that's all we're saying. And everybody sort of accepts it, you know, it's like, we, we've got to stand up to the bully in class, you know, and gang together and stop him beating up whoever he wants. And that's all we're trying to say to the people, that together you've got the power to stop it, you know? you just got to believe it. You know? yeah. Do you want to tell him the difference between yes, yes. Warhol you know, and self I mean, I, I respect Andy, you know, I mean, for his works and everything, all right. But, I mean, what he was, it's almost like you, you saying, well, uh, if I made a film of triangle relationship or something, well, that's being done by Jean-Luc Godard or, it's that, you know. Now, the thing is, what we are doing is so different from Andy in the sense, Andy is basically camp, you know, basically very camp, and whatever he's doing, He's, he has all these pretty boys, you know, sort of yeah. taking each other's pants off or something and laughing and giggling and all that. And uh, the influence that created, you know, in the whole world or whatever, was sort of this sort of campness, you know. Yes, that's very nice too, I think. But, you know, we have a more sort of immediate sort of message, which is peace, you know. And uh, all the, the rhythm of the whole thing is completely different, you know. He's never produced a film of a prick, you know, completely, you know, enlarged like that in slow motion, etc. you know, which he hasn't done. But, I mean, you know, it, it just isn't his style, you know, he would yeah, like a story there, you know, with uh, possibly, you know, one, one fag and maybe uh, one big Negro guy and a, a girl who's in between that. And See, what that, we know. like to do really is go to the extreme, as far as we can see straight away. So when we come up with an idea like uh, Yoko came up with the idea of the smile of my face, and once I got over the initial hour, well, the skyscraper, and for instance, uh, it's like the Mona Lisa or herself, but it's just a portrait of my face, and the moment you accept a portrait, people accept a pic of Van Gogh or something looking at you for a hundred years without moving. Why can't they accept a film? Or get, admittedly, at the time, the present situation, you all have to go somewhere to enjoy the Van Gogh, but you still have to go to the Tate to see most of the best old work, and you've got to sort of set yourself down and look at it. So at the moment, you've got to go to the ICA and watch that film. But the way we really conceive it is to, for people to have some kind of thing on the wall where the thing would be there all the time, you know, and now and then, you, as Yoko said, the portrait would just wink at you, but it'd still be a... So that's a portrait of me, and it could have been anybody, but she chose me, because we were in love, but she chose me before that. <laughs> right, because and, yeah, he represents something, doesn't he, in a way. And the, you know, the message I'm sending across was, she was on the other end of the camera, and I'm sending my love vibration, or whatever you call it, to her, and therefore... We were doing it like that. We were doing it between mm -hmm. each other, like mesmerising each other through the yeah. camera, therefore, I'm, I'm in a way, we then share it with the audience, you know. And the fact that three minutes of time, it's like when you first saw those pictures of a whole flower growing, you know, they did those trick films, and that was beautiful. It's the same thing. You can watch, how often do we look at each other? With that, we always have some reason to look away, you know, you know even the closest friend, you know, only that, your wife or your girl, mm. do you really look at her for hours till you know inside out. Mm. But when to watch somebody's face is fascinating. And if you get over the hang of this me, you know, I would have preferred to w watch Yoko's face yeah. or a, another woman's face, you know, rather than mine. It, you know, I, I, I get into it because it's, it's like looking in the mirror, it's very nice. But, you know, as an audience, I would have preferred Yoko you know, to look at, you know, as a, a woman to look at. But to look at some three minutes time, spaced out into two hours or whatever it is, is like taking an acid trip. 
you know, it's a That's it's a moment of time, ex, you know, blown up out of all proportion. And to give you, it's relative. Then it shows you the relativity of everything. It's sort of metaphysical, you know, in a sense that the timing is slowed down, the rhythm is so extremely slowed down. And uh, we like to see the world like that. In other words, if people start to have slow down their life, you know, because society is so speed, speeded up, I mean, naturally it becomes violent. I mean, even the most calm person would become violent. They have to. Like know? if you go to New York mm. or the States, you've got to change your whole attitude and everything. You really, you know, I, I always get shocked every time I land there. It's just, <coughs> and it's like life with the lions all the time. I was saying to somebody yesterday, it's like when the English hear life of the lions, they sort of go, wow, mm -hmm. you know, but the, in America, it's sort of accepted because they're, they're at that kind of noise mm -hmm. level or, or whatever it is all the time. Mm -hmm. You just get off the plane and it's, mm -hmm. it terrifies me, America, and it's all like that, I suppose, except for the backwood. So to, it's quite natural for them, you know, all that kind of thing. We've got to get in the scene, you know, and we've, it's, we've got to get in, in the in-club to get shown, you know, we've got to go with ICP or EMI, we've got to break through. And of course, I mean, we think sometimes be, we'd like to make a film that wasn't so avant-garde, underground, that you had to be one thing or the other to watch it, you know. And no doubt we will make, I mean, we make uh, documentaries of our trips abroad, which we just haven't got them together yet. The other guy did for us. But we have one in Montreal, which will probably be a reasonable, you know, working man's documentary, you know. And we find that interesting. But to get in on that scene where, where they've had Warhol and anywhere they've had Goddard, we've got to top them. It's like coming in, there's, there's the Beatles, the Stones and everything. Now, the, the, a group today to break through that, the Stones, Beatles, Jethro Tull, everybody that's around now. It's not like when Beatles broke through and there was only... When you look back, it doesn't seem there's any competition. There was nothing. But in the film world, they're leaping ahead like yeah. shit. You know, mm -hmm. Just as fast as the music business. And you've really got to top them. You've got to top them. It probably is the fastest medium. And it's no good coming out with another... I mean, we wouldn't be content with another... With making... Uh, what, another Andy Warhol? No, another Andy Warhol. Just content with making, oh, I can't think of one, Barbarella or something. You know, and it might be good fun, you know, or even 2001, you know. I dug 2001 like mad, but it's not, a, I think uh, Smile is a million years ahead of it, but 2001 was a beautiful trip. It's the difference between literature and TV, you know. But to get in it and blow the minds and, and blow the people in the business, and, you know, it's you've got to. You've got to try and top them, you know, otherwise there's no game, you know, you're doing it as a hobby. It'd be great to be on a local cinema, even if it was a small local cinema, because there's a guy that uh, does a film magazine, Fieber, that we've got him working upstairs now, because he goes around and produces the magazine, then moves on to the next country. He got so hooked on the films, he just got them under his arm, and his whole life is more our films than his magazine now. And he's been showing them in Denmark, Yugoslavia, just everywhere. And to houses of 2,000 people a night or, or 200 depending on what it is and he's given us the confidence to believe that there would be that many people around to watch them and dig them you know and so he's really pushing them right man and people like Danish TV are saying we'll give you $50,000 to do anything you like so we're beginning to believe it now so we have the choice of either we have to make the deal with somebody big and hope they'll distribute it worldwide which is the dream or we have to do it his way, you know, and just let him sort of pound the beat with them, going around with the demo discs. And he, he does things like put us in every film, uh, what are they called, exhibition, what are they called? Festival. Festival, Festival that there is everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. and get him in through that way. But even Festival, you know, I really like the idea of putting it on West End, you know, something like that. Well, that's what she did like with that. Bottoms, you know, yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she didn't even need Beatle back in to get West End showing of Bottoms as a fantastic effort. And mm. to produce films that it isn't such a great event every time a fucking film comes out, you know, <laughs> that it's just like telly. I mean, if that smile was on Channel 14 one night, and you could either watch that or the Wednesday play or Coronation Street, yeah. then it's not Im that important. Does it matter whether it's like Warhol or, you know, it's like Dylan said about Britons to hung up on its singers, you know, let, let it be less important that Beatles LP and the Beatles single and the Stone, let it just get the production get a bit faster and less 
talk and more sort of fun. And we're trying to make films as fast as we can, you know, and and just not get involved in. I mean, I'm always coming up with ideas, you know, because I don't know. Uh, actually, Richard Rauschenberg did it in 1930, <laughs> you know, because I've only just joined this game. No, but you know, but uh, up, apart from that, ideas. it's and just great to, to it, just you know. be involved, you know, just trying to think of way out things. Because he does come up with things, ideas you know. that, that precisely made those people famous, you know. It just yeah. bloody annoys me. It's like, it, you know, it really and brings me down. And I'm always down. doing it. I hate it. to be a drag, but, you know, I just always say it. You know. The thing is, I'm just not the type of person, neither of us are, to do a production of that scale, you know. We haven't got the money to sponsor films of that size. No, we the don't, Beatles see. money is a myth, you know. This <laughs> is all we own and the houses we've got. Anything else is a myth, you know. We are not millionaires. Mm. And, and if we are on paper, it's a joke, you know. We don't have the money people imagine, you know. And I, we've got a hard job to break even on the money we're spending out, you know. We're, we're putting into these films and that. We haven't broken Eden yet on all the films, films we made. Are very cheap and they're the cheapest kind of films. Because, I mean, Eden, Apple didn't want to know about Two Virgins. You know, even even now they're not sure. I mean, we've got friends here who dig Life of the Lions and that, but, you know, if they're sending out handouts to the press, that they forget all about uh, Life of the Lions or anything like that. And just recently there's been a big EMI meeting, uh, you know, sort of a yearly salesman meeting, and Kenny Everett, kindly or otherwise, made a, a record to play to him, saying, and like an Apple promo record, and he's talking about James Taylor and uh, the Ivies and all these people that haven't sold half as many records in the States as John and Yoko, but they just, it's as if we don't exist yeah. even in our own company half the time, you know. It's as if we don't exist here. Okay. And I mean, James Taylor and then, only Mary Hopkins has sold more than John and Yoko. Mm. And that's the freakiest stuff <laughs> possible. And mu much more important than James Taylor's music, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And our own company sending its own propaganda out, unless I'm here to catch the fucking elf, <laughs> the promos going out. It's like we don't exist, you know. Yeah, scared so we've got a fight. We, the fight starts here. In this clip, John sounds off on his current views about Apple and the rather consistent problem of pulling any real money out of the firm. A few years back, the Beatles and their advisors made some kind of deal, and when they set up Apple, that 80% of our royalties came into this business, and we can't get it out. It's as simple as that. So anything I earn, which is royalties, is what my main earning, comes into this building which I can't get out. They only, they set it up, I say they, that means the accountants and advisors, NEMS and all that. You don't name them, but just they. <laughs> set it up to go public, you know, like with Northern Songs, you know, with no thought of how, what we thought about it or anything, and we didn't look into it because it was stupid. So here we are with a company that eats our money up and takes it all up, and I haven't had any income for two or three years, you know. Even in the old days, I used to get a check now and then from Northern Songs or somewhere. I haven't seen any income for two or three years. All I've seen is outcome. It's amazing. You know, and it all sort of goes into this box and never comes out, you know. And the whole business now is to try and get it out. And then if I can get it out, I'll separate, you know. And then all my own earnings come to me, all George's earnings go to him, and etc., etc. Then I can do what I like with mine, and they can do what they like with theirs, you know. But at the moment, all our money is just sort of, I don't know, you know. Oh, no, not hostile, because it is, it is partly our baby, you know. It's just a... Uh, if it wasn't Apple, it'd be something else. All down the line, we've always had these tax experts saying, you better just do this so as you don't get that. And they always sort of tie the money up so as nobody can use it, nobody can touch it, and you get taxed anyway, you know. So we've really got to get out of it first, you know, release ourselves. Many of John and Yoko's experimental projects were almost strictly autobiographical. Here John describes the couple's work as a kind of living diary of their unconventional life. You tell me anybody doesn't like reading somebody else's diary. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. No. Right. Yeah. Who doesn't yeah. write a diary with the idea that it should be written? Yeah, I mean, who, who are we kidding, you know? Yeah. Now, the point is, uh, without, we've, we've made a physical manifestation of our diary. But, I mean,
watching the last film. You know, mm. I then it goes on and on because that's it's how. It's very honest uh, thing to show, isn't it? I mean, it's the, the most honest thing that happened then. And everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it is a diary, you know, and but it always has been. But now it's like, what? It's to quicken up the process, you know. Like the wedding album is, is sort of our heartbeats recorded on these special machines and. This is our next album together, mm-hmm. and us, me shouting Yoko and she shouting John, mm-hmm. and it gets sort of vaguely sexy in parts. But then so we couldn't get it out quick enough, you know, because of all the hassles. And then Jane Birkin's done this because everybody's going to say, oh, they're copying Jane Birkin, you know, and that's the the grind of trying to of this production, you know, whether it's EMI or ICP or whoever it is, of getting the the mess the stuff out as you do it, you know. I mean, it's the night ballad of John and Yoko. I just want to. Sort of do it right away and not be have it a great important event about people sing or just get them out. You know, if we have one, we do it and it comes out every week or an album a month or something. A lot of Yoko's work is like that. She's just bringing out a book called Grapefruit, which she brought out a few years ago. I'm just giving her a plug here. A few years ago, a limited edition, which is sort of poetry now. But at the end of it, it says after you've done this, eat it or throw it away. And a lot of her work is disposable work. You know. I think that's how it should be. You know. Not to, not to be so worshipping all this through. art all the time. Yeah. You see, when you keep things, they become all automatically, they become like tombstones, you know. And uh, the whole world is sort of clogged up with it. So, you know, it's better to circulate a little, isn't it? It's like I was saying something else today. The, the gardener that came with the house I've just bought saw all the stuff I was bringing in. He was saying, it's a load of bloody junk. Because <laughs> it is, I never had anything <laughs> expensive, you know. Uh, the only expensive things I ever had were a car or a house. Everything mm. else I own is rubbish. No, he doesn't have very I like to keep these, stuff. you know, and boxes and waste very paper tins. Things that you can't sell. And all that. And all, mm. all my worldly belongings are those things. And it's stupid, you know. Mm. But I still hang on to it, you know. Because it, it's like hanging on to your diary. You really think somebody's going to read it when you're dead or some shit. Whatever makes you keep it. But still, if we make our public art disposable, you know, or unimportant. One of John's great priorities circa 1969 was working to expose the so-called art myth, that is, that only very special, highly sophisticated people could participate in the creative process. He also comments about his ongoing peace projects with Yoko. I dig old things. It's just to get the perspective, you know, let's get the, the awe of the creator, you know, let's diminish it a bit, you know the wondrous artistic genius bit. You know, let's all do our thing. You know. Well, there's a few people come up with different ideas. One of them is this peace ship, you know, which sounds very interesting. A, because I read a book in Canada written by a, a Canadian DJ, which sort of predicted the whole thing. You know, he had a peace ship and it was white, it was international, everybody went on and talked straight to the people and then this guy turns up with the ship. So that's the next move. And there's a couple of people got ideas about Biafra and Nigeria, which we'll really finalize our decisions on this weekend. When you take the, the disc poll, which was really judging our lying in bed, we won, you know. It's like any Beatles new album or new single. At first they think, oh, it's not as good as Hey Jude or it's not as good as She Loves You because they're preconceived. So when we come out with a a new idea like staying in bed for a protest rather than marching up and down, everybody says fucking stupid. I bet they said it about marching with posters originally. Yeah. But now that the tune's sunk in, now it's accepted by the kids and a few of the old people. So it's not that strange that some old woman yeah. last week did a po- protest in bed outside hospital and was wheeled down the street. Yeah. It's an accepted form of protest now. <laughs> in the last few days, Two people have come up with two different exactly. ideas. The, the, guys, the other way. guy's waiting outside. And I can't really say anything about it because one sort of, he didn't want to talk about it on the phone, so he obviously doesn't want me to talk about it. And the other one is just sort of going there, you know, doing something. You see, because what we're in, we don't really expect, uh, if we went to see Nixon, say, for him to down tools, but at least we'd know where he stood. Yeah. ourselves personally we could be able to tell you then or something like that but what we're do after is people's minds you know and the only way to get people's minds is to work in a conceptual way yeah. you know and you can't have i'm not gonna really i don't think so anyway stand in the middle of the battlefield of vietnam like they tried to do to the peace nicks in the first world war and say peace and then get blown up no, no, you know, i'm not really looking that. for that and that's concrete i mean that's what the moaners want 
You know, they say, well, if you want peace, why don't you go and die for it? But it's not an excuse, but, but it sounds like uh, agitating people more, you know, doing things like that. You know? We're after their minds, you know, <laughs> just to change their minds. There's no other way. I don't believe you can change it any other way. I don't think you can change anything by violence. You can change the size of a building by burning it down and that. But you don't t change the mind of the man that built, built the building and built the factory and enslaved the people in it. And the only way was to... The, the, cha the workers changed them was to change their minds. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, a few of them got killed in the rush, but it was still less than were getting killed before. Mm -hmm. It's just minds you've got to change. Ever since the Beatles laid down their instruments forever following their final performance at Candlestick Park in San Francisco in 1966, journalists bombarded them with questions about a public reunion. Here Lennon faces the controversy head on. Oh, it's a possibility, but Ringo says it isn't, <laughs> so that's what it is. You know. Somebody was interviewing him at the time, no, no, saying, is there any talks? And we haven't talked at all, but I know I'd been talking with somebody, I don't know, Paul or somebody, about possibly going on tour, and it, you know, how we'd do it if we did. And then I read in the... Then somebody asked me, it was about the same time, I don't know whether it was... Well, you know, I don't think it was the same person, but it just so happened that both quotes came out about the same time. I was in Amsterdam or somewhere, somebody asked me about it. Obviously, if I saw all the press for the first time for a long time, they go through everything, you know, like you are anyway. You would have asked this anyway. So I said, yeah, it's a possibility of going on no, tour. No, no. The next day, somebody rings up and says, there's no tour, but he'd said that. You know, anyway, he'd been just doing an interview about Magic Christian, and of course, it's like if I'm talking about John and Yoko work, it's yeah, hard to no. keep it off Beatle work, right? That's and if Ringo's happens. talking about Magic Christian, it's hard to... It gets into what you did in Hamburg in 1980 and all that. So it was a case of that. You know. So I saw Ringo I said, well, what is it? He says, well, I don't know, but uh, I don't fancy it. And I said, well, I do, so on the certain side. And he said, it'll just be the same. And I said, well, it wouldn't be the same this time. And there it is, you know, so... And I'm not that keen on it. But I think it'd be... It wouldn't harm us. No. Well, so we wouldn't do it every night, you know, so as we, we were sort of jumping plane from plane. We'd do it to suit us, you know, and not the promoter or anybody else. Because also, the, because all this business is going on and res reshaping Apple and Northern songs, it's almost impossible to talk about what the Beatles are going to do as the Beatles. So they're so involved in this, you know. And, uh, but the thing we can do, regardless of what kind of wars going on round, the, round about, is record. Let It Be seemed to be both the best of times and worst of times for the Beatles. John explains the fairly convoluted project. The new one, the single one, Hello? It's, Hello? it's probably sort of, it's like live, you know, it's uh, as-is recordings that we did while we were filming, you know, we are filming ourselves during that period. So it's Hello? like uh, no... No gimmicks, you know, it's just if we did a bum take after about ten times, we picked the best one of that. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Apple Skyline, you know, Nashville Skyline, yeah. backwards. You know, we went in, we, we sang them and came out. We were really rehearsing okay, for the show we were, we were going to do, but we never did the show, so the, the album is a rehearsal yeah. for a show that never was. Ever since they released their first record, the Beatles were known as Toonsmiths not content to rest in the lucrative mold of success they had created for themselves. John comments on the Beatles' ever-evolving style. Well, the basic style's never really changed, you know. It's some yeah. tunes slow with an offbeat and some tunes fast with an offbeat. Yes, please. And that's, that's what it is, you know. Some tunes slow with an offbeat and some tunes fast, yeah. you know. A couple of ballads, a couple of rockers. The usual meat, you know. And just what was it like appearing live at the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival? But when I heard all those Little Richard and Chuck Berry was going to be on, I, that, I thought, right, let's go. And of course, I was so busy being nervous and sick backstage, I never saw oh, really? them. Yeah. I was crapping myself, you know, <laughs> because I hadn't performed for, for 20 years or something. I mean, I'd done the uh, Cambridge 69 with Yoko, but I'd, that was a small place, and I just sort of with my guitar, but this time I... And I said, yeah, well, how's it go? And, and the band, I couldn't rehearse. Inevitably, I have saved the best for last. If you weren't around back then or perhaps weren't paying attention, it may be difficult to comprehend just how important and untouchable a figure was Beatle John. 
something someone obviously forgot to convey to this daring, insightful, and frankly, fairly cantankerous New York journalist. Listen carefully and see who you think presents the most convincing arguments. And don't let John's mile-high celebrity get in the way, either. This is a no-holds-barred tussle between two keenly aware, opinionated people. Just the kind of high-octane repartee that's missing in our milk-toast time of PG ratings, blue-collar talk shows, and 24-hour news channels. I'm going to reverse the usual rule of interviewing and say something to you and ask you if you agree with me. Um, I was dismayed and appalled by what you did sending back the MBE because um, you didn't appreciate the award, fine, and you didn't care about having it, and you were going to send it back anyway in 1970, so you used two huge, catastrophic events of unspeakable horror as a convenient reason, when you might just as well have said, I got up and had a sinus headache this morning. A convenient reason for what? For sending back the MBE. I mean, did you really send it back as a protest about the Nigeria of the Yeah, Yes, OK, here's the answer. Uh, I mean, you said you didn't ever want it. You didn't yeah, have do you wanna, do you to hear, use it when you got uh, it. When, when do I get a go? Listen, uh, I wanted to send it back for maybe a year or more. I was thinking about it, doing it privately. I have a choice of sending it privately or publicly. If I send it privately, it would have gone out into the press anyway. There's no, there's not, I can't do things like that privately. So if you accept that, I have two choices. Send it back privately and it gets out anyway or make a point of sending it back publicly and make some use of sending it back. Apart but from, you didn't make any use. Well, I can, it's a matter of opinion. Uh, you see what you did. I mean, listen, uh, it's a matter of opinion whether it was any use or not. The Biafra and public relations people thought it was of great use. Bertrand Russell thought it was of great use. So it's a matter of opinion. Sending back something entitled. you never wanted anyway? Well, you're, in, you're entitled yes, to that. We were going to get married anyway. Yeah. Can you tell them to stop that noise yeah. downstairs? It wasn't because, uh, you know, because we thought, well, we should uh, do a bed event for peace that we got married, you know. We got married anyway. But we used that to sort of advertise peace as well, you know. And it's like if Jackie and Nassis had done it, instead of hiding on the island with, with her husband, uh, which we could have attempted to, and would have been caught out anyway, and followed and filmed, we decided, instead of being a staggered bay, to say, okay, you're going to follow us anyway, let's make use of this uh, scene, this sort of mess that goes on anyway and it, just and struck, it just struck me as a gesture that diminished you sending back something that was worthless calling a a war that is so grotesque and, and yeah horrible. but some people don't consider it worthless that's why i had to, listen if it was okay that it's worthless word again, if it's worthless so, so what it's not that old you know i mean my god people are killed every minute you know but i've and been to the yeah but i mean yes okay but still it, it doesn't change the fact that people are killed there every day i mean the fact that you've been there it doesn't mean anything and all right so no it's that's okay. meaningless so, too but yes, yes. so the point is that they're killed and maybe it's an old thing for people to be killed but still it's horrible you, know? then you don't understand what i'm saying well, that you were again. better than what you did so why did you do it and diminish yourself because I people don't. just thought you just did it as a gag the you people know. thought we just did the bed event as a gag and a lot Didn't of them you? have changed their minds no, what well, the hell did. I've told you, if, he, if the Biafran public relations thought it was good for their cause, yes. do you think I'd accept their opinion over yours any day? I'm not worried about what people think I should be doing. I'm writing nice little arty books and making nice little bits of music for people. The people of Biafra have thanked me for doing that event, and that's enough. He, they must know, because they're in a very tough situation, you know. And if they, they want all the publicity they can get. Hmm. The, all they want is publicity. So for a start, that's what they need. Yes, but why did you have to say that I was going to send it back anyway? And this was a convenient Because when people moment, ask like me, if the people right. ask me what, why I sent it back, and had I ever thought of sending it back, and did you think of it last night or last year, I'd give them a straight answer, which is I've been thinking about it, I've been thinking of sending it back any, anyway, but I'm going to make use of it rather than just send it back anyway. It's, it's the same it's thing as saying, I'm ordering lunch, and I'm not going to have apple pie, because I don't like apple pie anyway, and that's my answer to the Right, if it, gets in, if it gets in the, on the front page of the paper that I don't but like, like apple pie for peace, but it's not all I care about, get on listen, the page, listen, diminishing listen, I know that. Yes. The only reason, if I'm going to get on the front page, I might as well get on the front page with the word peace. But you've made yourself ridiculous. To some people, I don't care. If, if, you're too good if for it what saves you're doing. lives. You don't think you, oh, my dear boy, you're living in a never, never. Well, uh, you talk to you the. You don't think you've saved a single life. Uh, well, maybe we'll save something in the future. Maybe about the future. It didn't do a bit of use. No. It's still gone down, so it didn't do anything. But, I mean, you don't equate of the civil war that's look, going on listen, in Nigeria with that. And you, then talk about, well, this is my form of protest. Well, look. People in anti-war campaigns are too serious. Yes. 
And they get better. What do you know about a protest movement anyway? I know a lot it about it. It's a lot more than sending your chauffeur in your car back to Buckingham Palace. You're just a snob about it. The only way to make... fake. Okay, that's your opinion. You live in another Netherlands. Let's just let's answer. We use the... No one will ever say this. I'm sure they're down on their knees. plenty of people. Plenty of people on their high horses. There are people who know what protest means. It doesn't involve chauffeurs and cars. And sending back medals you despised in the first place. You're embarrassing. Do you despise advertising? I have nothing to do with it. Oh, you, you don't like it? Is that what it is? I don't consider it. Oh, well, you we use advertising. We use advertising. Constantly. And politicians you are try. your own can I? Can you shut up a minute? I'll try. We use advertising. Everybody in this century uses advertising, including politicians, the Biafrans, the Vietnamese, and everybody. So I personally happen to be in that game. I use advertising to promote what I think, and I think peace. So I promote it with the, using the technique of advertising. And what you think about it is egal or whatever they say. Well, you know, if the Biafrans are so desperate, and if they thought that uh, this is not healthy, they're not going to stand up about it. You know, well, what do you think children. about that? Oh, well, if you're one of the... Uh, why give why do they stand you know? I don't know what you think about that. Well, if you've got better ideas, we're, we're, we're open to suggestions. Since we've done the few events we've done, people have come up with some good and some bad, and we do them. You know who told the tall tall is, don't you? Yes, I heard you about know. it. Well, I mean, you know, the one thing we You know Mickey about. Mouse? Yeah, well, I mean, I know you like Wind in the Willow. Every politician was trying to jump on the bandwagon to cash in on the Beatles. Harold beat them to the punch, and old Ted missed it. Anyway, Ted insulted me in Parliament over my first book. Who cares? They if Ted insulted me. your first book. I don't know. About well, you cared enough to have it written down in a bit of paper. So You're right, the people that write into the newspaper and say, if I ever read about that John Lennon and Yoko Ono in the newspaper again, I'm going to complain, and they do it again. You're doing exactly the same. Don't mention well, it if you don't care. What are you? I had to. I wouldn't have got choice. Why don't you go to Biafra and give money? I don't want to well, get killed, you know. The publicity, the Biafran publicity department got out of that was worth about a quarter of a million pounds. And if I give every penny I've got, then that's the end of that money and I can't do it. I've got to start again to do what I'm doing. Publicity is money, you must know. Because Pub the publicity the Biafrans got out of that was worth about a quarter of a million dollars or whatever, in anybody's language. Those people that need money for adver advertisement. That's what they thanked us for, for bringing the attention of the public to the problem, in whatever form. They don't care how you do it, as long as you get them a mention. And that's all it's about. You see, if uh, they were really starving, you know, and then if you give anything other than food, you know, a, a starving man is going to hit you back immediately because he, he'd be angry because he always wants his food. Now, the thing is, the Afghans are very desperate people. If he did something that was fake, you know, they would immediately hit us. That's it. My God, I mean, why are you say? I mean, they'll be saying the things that you say. They'll be the first one to say it. Well, there's going to be a discussion because you're saying, look, the, Biafran, the uh, Republic of Biafran Mission in London thanked me, so I'm wrong, and, and you don't see the point at all. I mean, I well, that's a good point because they're, they're so, the ones who are in trouble, and they're the, they're the ones that we try to help. I mean, you don't count in this game. They're the ones who need help, and we gave help to them. So if they thank us, then we're happy, you know. Well, then why didn't Mr. Lennon make kind of a more meaningful gesture now that we all know he wanted to give back the medal anyway. It's regret. Why are you so hung up on the medal? The medal's, the medal no, has nothing to do with it. No, exactly. So, so this is why but without the medal, there would have been no publicity. I would have had to think of something else to interest our brothers of the press. But the medal was a godsend. The medal was lying there and it was put to use. It doesn't matter that I didn't want it anyway. It was no sacrifice to give it. No. The drag is, I don't even get rid of it, I find out in the end. But that's, a, it was just a huge joke, the whole thing. Oh, uh, well... Well, not, not a joke to them, you know. I'm, you're not laughing, them, I'm not laughing. Know. And the uh, meaningfulness, you know, it, it may not be meaningful to you, but I mean, you're not the one well, who's dying. Also, you're not the one who's dying. Mrs. Lennon, who's dying. I know probably you know. more about the Afro than you do, and I know exactly well, I what the... Dying is dying, dying whatever it is. So yeah, the Biafran Public Relations know. Office, thank you. So yes, and yes, Bernard yes. Russell, who knows a damn time more about protest than you, probably, as you're well, claiming know, uh, and absolute knowledge on protest movements. We don't know much about protest movements. He we know some of them go wrong and some of them go right. But he's like a king of the protest man, ain't he? And he, 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 didn't, he didn't say anything to us about bed event. He obviously didn't think much about it or think it was effective or whatever. I didn't understand it. But the MBE effect affected him, and that's his generation. And we got a telegram from him this morning saying, uh, whatever, you know. And, and he's the daddy of the protest, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. He ought to know about protest, you know, if you think he doesn't know, and he can't, doesn't he? I mean, we're, we're just beginners in this protest bit. We've what only been doing it a year. Against we're protesting the against... The war? We're Any protesting war? against... All we were trying to do, for the, mainly for Biafra, is because I began to be ashamed of being British. 
There I was talking about Vietnam or anything else and realising how much involvement Britain had in Vietnam. I only learned over a period of time. Why did that and quite so precious? Because I'd well. learned in the game of being in the public eye and that if the castle falls by attack, but it falls from within like America's doing at the moment. And Yoko told me also that we were doing this naturally, but Yoko told me about some ancient Chinese book which advises how to fight the battle. And it says that never close all the doors because the enemy will attack in vast concentration. But if you leave one door open, you know where the enemy is going to come in. And we leave many doors open, like irrelevant remarks about cold turkey, long hair and nakedness. And while people are so busy attacking that, we can get on with the job of uh, protesting for peace because that's what we do. You know, and while they're bothering about how long the hair is and the irrelevancy of cold turkey and how dare you insult the queen and your auntie was upset by handing it back, the well, main purpose... The garbage, no okay, the main, that's yeah. leaving the door open as far as we're concerned. And uh, that's... I've, yeah, <laughs> I've forgotten what we're saying. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're sincere about it, you know. Whether you like it or not. And the outside is absolutely sincere. And many people are taking it, you know, I mean, you know. So, that's that. I personally am too frightened to go to Biafra. I'm a nervous type and I don't want to be a dead saint. And people prefer dead saints than live freaks. And we intend to stay live freaks as long as we can. And you really think all anti-war movements make the same mistake? They get no. serious and get battered to pieces. I would the protest movement by kind of untalented, dreary, middle-class housewives in America had an astonishing effect you know, on, on what's happened in America about public opinion, and so... I think the protest movement is great in America. I just think parts of it went wrong when it gets into violence. I said the difference between us... In that they take it very seriously. It isn't the occasion to be flip and precious and crack a joke. I mean, that's two bright young things. Why not? That's not. The People are cracking. Days. Sometimes you behave People like a kind of bright young thing. Well, I think you all have a sense of humor, you know. I don't have a sense of humor. Oh, I've oh, lost it. Well, Don't you? Yeah. Uh, no. I think it's a good time to lose. No, I think lots of sense of humor is what's the matter with you and the rest of them. Well, I don't have your the sense of humor. Then. It's so easy to People, it. people it joke. People make jokes in the, well, they're in the middle of that, those scenes. You know, you've seen the old war he's films, haven't you? He's serious enough on the help, and that's the... All, what, thing all we're saying is that... But why don't you stop joking? It's, it's not funny anymore. It really isn't. I, mean, oh, I, I know think. in England it's, it's kind of smart not everything to be too serious about smile. anything. Everything needs a smile, you know. I see. For instance, even if... The Peaceville Massacre, ha, 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 smile. Oh, listen. Very good. Uh, when your mother is dying, if you start to shriek and, you know, become hysteric about it, your mother is not going to die in peace, and you need a smile. Well, maybe she won't die anyway. My God, I mean, a smile is going to help, you know. A little smile to Well, I mean, I think, you know, anger is appropriate. I mean, seriousness is appropriate. And yes, it well, of course I get be... angry. What do you think yes. I do? I'm, I do, I get angry as well, but... Uh... I mean, but for God's sake, to relate what Mr. Heath said about your... Book, they asked me about that after the event. I'm not going to say, I don't want to talk. I don't care. I don't what care what... Said. What do you care what he said? He's a very honest person, and if there's somebody asks about anything, he's going to answer, you know, make it... They wanted the, the full, my thoughts, over the years, leading up to getting rid of the MBE, and that was it. Can't you give up? <laughs> it doesn't, it's not the sacrifice. You can't get that into your head, can you? You've stated a half a dozen times the MBE is irrelevant. I agree. It was no sacrifice to get rid of the MBE because it was an embarrassment. What kind of a protest was, did you make? You said, we I don't we did an advertising area. campaign for peace. There Can you understand that? No, I can't. A very big advertising campaign for peace. I think it's self Are you advertising for peace? Well, you think it's, oh, do you want, do you want peace? nice middle-class gestures for peace Maybe. and intellectual it's manifestos there, written by a lot of half-witted intellectuals and nobody reads them? Oh. That's the trouble with the peace movement. Oh. Is intellectualizing the thing and handing out pamphlets. And all middle class people in America protesting about the war for the last three years who are not a people. Not all of them, well, I don't why, did you, why did you need oh, that three years and it's still not happening? Would you say that that's very effective? I don't think we should I mean, discuss they, the effectiveness of it oh, all. Right. So on the court, but I, mean, I think it was interesting. I think, yes, it changed a lot of things. Okay, you know, well, this these were middle class well. people, sure. Okay, so who didn't give press it. conferences and have much money and went out well, and shuffled along with Dr. Spock and hammered away, and they were not political. Oh, and it was not Rome, genuine all protest. All leads to Rome. I mean, no, no, no Rome don't lead to Rome, Mrs. Lennon. And there is no Rome. If it's effective, that's all. Oh, she's read the book. I haven't read any book in about six months. No, I'm not going to settle for all Rome's lead to Rome. Well, we're telling people well, to we're protest in an individual you just way. You want everyone to agree with you. Well, I I, about, peace, yes. about peace, yes. About peace. Yes. It's harder than that. You know. Well, people agreeing about peace is a start. You know. The fact that even we're arguing about it is better than us not arguing about it on TV, whatever angle we're talking about. I don't think people... I don't know. I mean, you have to be out in public relations office. I mean, I... 
can't take any of this seriously. God knows. If I would have a few years ago, anything you said or did you have to take it seriously. Well, I wouldn't. No. You know, but I this all looks it. like a circus. Why are you Well, it's a it? circus for peace, then. You know. it, we, we agree it's a circus. And we're Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. It's a theater. Well, it's, it's, oh, you, it you is a theater. Fun. It is I a mean, theater. It will always be creative and interesting. Anything you and Mrs. Lennon do. But to delude yourself in the thing is the peace. I mean, I said, no, you've got the telegram from Earl Russell and the Beata Public Relations Office. Mm -hmm. You know. But it is like a circus. It's a new one. A circus one. for peace. It's a gifted one. But what has it got to do with peace? It's advertising peace. If you advertise Coca-Cola, you uh, have a lot of irrelevant pictures of people dancing about and 20th century cars, and you, add, you throw Coca-Cola in at the end of it. So we advertise peace by having a lot of irrelevant scenes going on, either in bedrooms or MBEs yeah. or whatever it is, and at, at the, the tagline is always peace. Yes, but, you know, peace has become one of those sort of fatuous words that the young first started to use, and now everybody uses, you know, just one more banality like, like thing. You know, in Nigeria, the Afro thing is that you couldn't quite remember what it was, but thing, yeah. I just you know, wrote thing, it, I wrote thing. it the way I speak, you know, I, I don't uh, You can't speak like letters. that when you write so brilliantly. I, mean, I write know, letters what, what as thing? I think I mean, that, that, well, when people talk about the Nigerian, the Afro thing, they talk about it in those terms, and I talk the way I talk, that's just, the, and I write the same way. And when I talk about Nigerian Biafra thing, I talk about the Nigeria Biafra thing. I'm not going to put the Nigeria Biafra confrontation or change with. It's a war. Well, call it what you like. When people refer to it on the street or in Thanks. general, Thanks. some people refer to it as a thing, you know. Yeah. And I happen to be one of those. I think uh, what you call it or how you name it has got nothing to do with it. It's more irrelevant than the MBE. But I think that is very important, you know, just that that thing kind of um, diminishes the, the tragedy. You know, for instance, uh, you know about uh, the Oriental culture and all yes. that, you know, the way they show themselves, yes. you know, express love, you know, yes. for instance, they don't kiss each other or yes. something in public, etc., they're very yes. modest and all that. But that's one way of expressing love. And the Italians, they might just go like this, you know. Yes. And of course, there are many ways of expression, you know. And many. It's all love, you know. But if you were advertising peace and... And you, you can't know. say, well, Italians are more vulgar than the Orientals. The Orientals are less, ex you know, less uh, loving or whatever than yes. the uh, Italians. And they're just ways of expression. And we happen to express our uh, way, you know, of peace this way. You know? Sure, and you're getting telegrams from people who agreed with you in the first place. Yes. Are That's you encouraging. Are anybody? You know. Yes. yes no, they didn't agree with us in the first place. No, a lot of people no. wrote to us. No, after no, what I'm talking about, you know, the telegram from Earl Russell and the BBC. Well, I mean, he never, I'm saying he never sent us a telegram yeah. about the bed event, which we thought was just as good a peace advertisement as the MBE. But the MBE seemed to have got through to him on some kind of level, and therefore he felt he had to send a telegram. Well, but uh, he, he obviously, oh, we, we do something, we have something lined up for Christmas. Uh, hope you like it. You might like it better, or you well, might like it worse. Well, advertising, then, you know. You don't like advertising. Well, that's the sort of. Uh, the American. I mean, there doesn't seem to be much sincerity in what you personally are doing about it, maybe it's because I'm a foreigner. Sincerity. You're speaking, is, uh, I mean, it just kind of shouts. It it you want sincerity uh, from a public relation. I can see relation. you waking up saying it's Tuesday. Let's see what war is going on and what should we do today. I mean, I, there must be other people who feel the same way I do. I, I suppose not. I'm not There's probably I'm many of you. I mean, Akira, well, why don't you try and reach us because you're trying to persuade people trying, who don't yeah. have your permission. We're trying. Yeah. But, I mean, couldn't you do something with a little more simplicity and. Well, this next, this next event is pretty simple. You leave your chauffeur out of it. Why? I mean, walk. Why? Walk. Why? Why? I had things to do. I had things to do. I'm not going to go humping down to the palace and wasting half an hour to live in it. You throw it out. Why? I mean, leave the theatre out of it. Why? Why? You can even call it the theatre of war, sweetie. This is the theatre of peace we're in, and they're in the theatre of war. Well, it just seems another never I mean, I can't think of anyone who seems more remote well, from the ugliness of what's someday. happening than you. Well, I, I do you see you getting up on a Tuesday morning. Let's see, what should we do today? What war is going on? Well, that's your imagination, you know, really. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you carry on. You make, why don't you make a film on it, that's it. I'm someone who admired you very much. Well, I'm sorry you, know, you like yeah, your yeah. mock-ups, dear, and you thought it was, you know, it was very satirical well, and witty, on the and you like Hard Day's Night Love, but I've grown up, but you obviously haven't. Have you? Yes, folks. What have you grown up to? No, 29. Was the trip in India nice? It was okay. It was a holiday. Yes, yes. How was it? We did a nice war protest on the army TV while we were there. Right away, yeah. I suppose you didn't like us going to Greece, eh? You think you shouldn't go to a fascist country like Greece, and but it's all right to live in a fascist country like Britain or America, is it? I think America is a good place to live right now, because, I mean, if you were interested or, or committed and not too cowardly, you might conceivably make a difference. Well, we've been trying to go to America to do something for the last 
seven or eight months, oh, but, but I can't get in. Oh, yeah, they take it seriously. Uh, you don't then, understand how they protest, the, my dear. They don't. Uh, they listen, uh, will you tell me what were they singing at the moratorium? Which, which, I mean, the moratorium but is the, the one throughout the But the, the one here, the, the, the recent big one, they were singing Give Peace a Chance, you know. How strong is yours? Uh, well, yes, I and it was written specifically up. for them. There you go. Well, well I can only... That's so large and interesting and complex to me. My song. He doesn't but you're saying they take it so seriously? Maybe that song was flippant. Maybe they'll name a city after you, and you never will have to oh, go you're, there. You're, you're on you know, the... it does rain outside, Mr. Bennon. Will you never put away your umbrella, ever? Oh, she's so poetic. Well, what, is she a writer or something? No, I'm not. No, but you're you not a writer. writer. Yeah, no, I'm not a writer. And so writers are expected to be ar articulate. Well, I think it's rather nice that they have a song now to sing. But they're... Much more important things happened that day in the United States sure. than Mr. Leonard's no. song. Did I say it was the but most that important thing that happened? I brought it up. Hey, you said they were so serious in America, they wouldn't even sing it up. Why don't you have on your I don't know. Don't that? ignore me ever. I put that on. Why don't you have it tattooed on your forehead? Are you Why so you frightened, Mr. Job? Lennon, that we might ignore you? No, no, is that what you're that. so terrified of? Oh, really? Because lots of people are happening in the world that don't have anything to do with this office. And your little precious world, Mr. Lennon. And when you go out in the rain, maybe something will happen to you. You go out in the rain, you know. You like, I mean, like going out in the rain. Where are we and what is this? And what did you have to do with the moratorium? So they sang one of your songs. Well, if you, you, if you can't show sure. up, I'll wait. Is that what you have to say about that? The moratorium? You were saying that in America they're so serious about the protest movement. Yes, they are. But they were so flippant that they were singing a happy-go-lucky song, which happens to be one I wrote. And I'm glad they sang it. And when I get there, I'll sing it with them. When I get in. And that was a message from me to America or to anywhere that I used my songwriting ability to write a song that we could all sing together. And I'm proud that they sang it at the moratorium. I wouldn't have cared if they sang We, can o we Shall Overcome, but it just so happens they sang that, and I'm proud of it. And I'll be glad to go there and sing with them. Make it jolly. I will make it jolly. Yes, yes, you know, we have to make it jolly. Well, we can't all afford to be neurotic. Maybe we might stop the war. By know. being jolly? Yes, it's because the thing is, when you're happy and when you're smiling, you don't want to kill somebody, do you? You know, it's when you're very serious you start to think about violence and death and killing. I mean, have you ever seen a person, a person killing somebody with a smile on his face and being happy? No. Killers are unhappy people. And they're violent because they're so unhappy and so damn serious. Mrs. Did, Lennon, we're boring each other, so I'll go away. See you about that? I mean... Get a leaving. Thank you. Goodbye. Good luck in the rain. Remember the rain. Good, Good luck in it. Jeffrey Giuliano is the author of some 30 internationally best-selling books on the Beatles, John Lennon, and other iconic musicians of the 1960s. In 2006, his book, Paint It Black, The Murder of Brian Jones, was made into a film by Stephen Woolley and Nick Powell entitled Stoned, The Wild and Wicked World of Brian Jones. It remains a cult classic and the only film bio of the Rolling Stones. Giuliano is also a veteran journalist, having written for dozens of high-profile newspapers and magazines, including The Sunday People, The Daily Mail, The News of the World, The Mail on Sunday, Playgirl, and Rolling Stone. A noted film actor, Giuliano starred in such movies as Vikingdom, Scorpion King 3, Jules Verne's The Mysterious Island, The Fifth Execution, Far Cry 3, Fire Fire Desire, among many. In addition, he hosted the long-running North American syndicated radio series, Jeffrey Giuliano's Roots of Rock, for five years, as well as pioneering the audiobook industry in the 1990s by authoring, narrating, and producing over 250 original, non-book-based, interview-driven productions. Giuliano's publishers included Random House, HarperCollins, Delta Entertainment, Durkin Hayes, Playaway Audio, Speechworks, and B&B &B Audio, among dozens more internationally. In 1998, Random House acquired his firm Tribute Audio, for which Giuliano acted as CEO and publisher for five years. His best-selling audiobook, That Fateful Night, True Stories of Titanic Survivors in Their Own Words, was nominated for a Grammy. In 2014, Jeffrey Giuliano founded Icon Editions and G2 Media Arts to market his updated works as well as publish new projects. As a visual artist, Jeffrey has been showing in galleries across America since 1977, garnering impressive reviews. His first professional assignment was designing several t-shirts 
for The Who's Pete Townsend in 1976. Jeffrey also designed and illustrated many of his original rock biographies for the biggest publishers in the world from 1984 to 2006, as well as designing for his pioneering record label, Samba Records, in the mid-1990s. From 2006 to 2011, Jeffrey was also the primary designer for the French fashion house Cotai. When Giuliano first conceived of creating his own literary imprint, Icon Editions, he became responsible for illustrating and designing 35 book covers, several hundred CDs, DVDs, as well as dozens of promotional posters, and eventually, an entire collection of exclusive fashion and art. The expansive design by Giuliano brand grew out of Jeffrey's impressive commitment to the arts and is the culmination of a lifetime's work by an extraordinarily talented and determined Renaissance man.